So we're looking at what they didn't teach you in Sunday school. What they didn't teach you in Sunday school. And if you're expecting, as Phil clearly was, me to bring my toy Noah's Ark with me, which, by the way, I don't have, but if that's what you're expecting, perhaps I'll turn it on. Perhaps you're expecting something that looked like uh, this or this or even this. Or if you're of more classical disposition, we used to have an elder who was trying to educate us in the church, and every time he uh, spoke, he'd have a classical piece of art, of course relevant to what he was going to say, uh, to educate us went along. I can't even remember who this was painted by, so I'm not helping at all. But that might be what you're expecting tonight. I hope not. Because if that's the sort of thing you're expecting, you're going to be sadly disappointed. Because what we're talking about was absolutely not like that at all. Let's just uh, bow our heads in prayer. Let's pray as we get into God's word. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for your love to us. We thank you for the faith that you give us in order that we can, by faith, be saved. We thank you for this story of Noah and ask that you'd just help us understand how deep and great his faith was, that we'd be inspired, that we'd be uh, more trusting, uh, perhaps be emboldened to live lives that bring you glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so on your sheet, you have a whole series of questions because that's what I came with as I read this well-known passage and as I thought about uh, what, uh, what it was about, I came with a whole lot of questions. They might be your questions. On the other hand, they might not be your questions. You might look at some of those questions and think, what an idiot. Fancy him not knowing that. Or you might just pretend to think that. But we're going we're gonna to look at some of these questions. Uh, so what was the source of the account is our very first question. What was the source of the account? And this is amazingly relevant for reasons that I'll, I'll um, come on to in just a moment. You see, some people believe that this part of Genesis was written quite a lot later. Some people believe that as Daniel and his friends were among those taken into Babylon, they borrowed an account of the worldwide flood from the Babylonians. You remember that, uh, that he went. In Daniel 1, verses 1 to 7, it says these things. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, into king, the king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These he carried off, uh, with, uh, they, these he carried off to the temple of the, his God in Babylonia and put the treasure in the treasure house of his God. A and it continues. He said, you know, go back, get some, get some bright people. Go back and uh, pick up some people, some Israelites, to help us. Because the Babylonian Empire at that time was expanding and getting bigger, and this is what they did. As they conquered nations, they'd take back to themselves not just artifacts, not just gold and silver, precious things, but they'd take back bright people as well. Not just from among the Jews, in this case, but, but among all the nations that they captured. Uh, and these were what they were. He said, bring in some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility, young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They would be trained for three years. Sounds like going away to university. Except they didn't feed us so well there. And after that, they were to enter the king's service. Among these were some from Judah, Daniel, and so on. And so some people believe that Daniel went and nicked the story of the flood. And why it's relevant is because as an avid Radio 4 listener, this book is currently out, 
Uh, and this book is being widely discussed on Radio 4. And uh, Irvin Frinkel says, and based upon a piece of uh, terracotta this size, he's written the whole book. That's amazing in itself. But he's studied this piece of, uh, piece of pottery for about 20 years. And from this piece of pottery, he can tell us that not only does the Babylonian story predate the biblical story, but it's exactly where Daniel got the story and exactly why it now appears in Genesis for us. That's amazing. How is it that some people are prepared to work so jolly hard to disprove parts of the Bible? Why would you want to do that? Now, however it came about, you see there's a different, significant time difference between the Genesis account and the Babylonian account. There are other differences as well, which we're going to touch on in a moment, but there is a huge time difference. The biblical account talks about a worldwide flood happening very early on after creation. The Babylonian account has it happening several thousand years later. So, question one, where did the account come from? Question two, why was the flood necessary? What is it that happened that made it necessary for a loving Heavenly Father who created this wonderful garden that has had the heartache of his people turning their back on him why has it come to this stage where he's now sending a flood? Well, the verses we read in chapter 6, 13 and then 17 and 18, tell us this, as you'll remember. So God said to Noah, I'm going to put an end to all people, for the earth is filled with violence. Because of them, I'm surely going to destroy both them and the earth. He goes on, I'm going to bring about floodwaters on the earth, destroy all life under the heavens, every creature that has breath of life in it. Everything on earth will perish, but I will dis establish my covenant with you, and you will enter the ark, you and your sons and your wife and your sons' wives with you. You see, in the Babylonian account, the reason there was a worldwide flood is because there were so many people on the earth that their noise of all their idle chatter rose to the God's ears and they got fed up with the noise so their gods destroyed everything on the earth. Noisy chatter. It's a warning to those of us that chatter that chatter not only causes those sort of problems, but could annoy the gods as well. They just didn't like it. But so they flooded the earth. The biblical account talks about sin. The biblical record presents the flood as a distinctly moral judgment. It's people not meeting God's moral standards. The human race have become so corrupt, as in verses 11 and 12, full of violence, as we're told in 11 and 13, that God's wrath would destroy all flesh except Noah. And the reason it wasn't going to destroy Noah was in verse 9 we're told that he walked with God and also saved with his family, as we read in verse 18. So the flood was a cleansing operation much like the bath you have on a regular base, I hope, but far more effective. So what did this ark look like? What sort of thing would it look like? Well, Phil would have been very, very bored by my mystic model, should I have indulged him. Verses 14 and 16 were given this description of it. So make for yourself an ark of cypress wood, make rooms in it, and coat it with pitch inside and out. Make a roof for it, and finish the ark within 18 inches of the top. Put a door in the side of the ark, 
and make lower, middle, and upper decks. It was a flat-bottomed vessel with three decks. So it might... Oh, 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 oh that's interesting. It might up there have looked like something like that. But you see, that's probably still not correct because uh, it looks like a boat. Because ever since, or almost ever since the flood, people have been used to building boats to get about. Because since the flood, there's been significant amounts of water on the earth. Previous to the flood, no, I hadn't seen water in that sort of quantity. So why would you put a front end point and a back end point on it? It wasn't going to go anywhere, the ark. It was just going to bob around for a while. It wasn't going to sail anywhere. It wasn't going to move along anywhere. Its purpose was to stay afloat. So why would you need a sharp end? I might not have made an arc. Oh, is there any way of enhancing that with a bit of light? No, he's gone to sleep. He's probably listening to something else entirely. Could you sort of raise the contrast on it a bit? Because there is a man. His name is Johann Hubers. He's a Christian who's... You, oh, right, not me, it. He's... he's that's it, turn me down a bit. Oh, dear, oh, dear. Uh, he's used chapters 6 to 9 of Genesis and a bit of inspiration. Following the instructions, he's made this monster a complete life-size model of Noah's Ark. It took him a long time and he's not quite sure what to do with it now. <laughs> he's turned it into a Christian museum but isn't very often visited, I'm told. In contrast, the Babylonian version says that uh, what you needed to create or what they needed to create because they had people saved and animals saved as well, what they had was a flattened semisphere. It was like an enormous coracle about the size of half a football pitch. So it was a bit different. Similar uh, to this account, of the salvation of Moses from Exodus 2. Now, a man of the house of Levi married a Levite woman. She became pregnant and gave birth to a son. When she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him for three months. When she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him, coated it with tar and pitch, and she placed the child in it and put it among the reeds along the river bank of the Nile. It didn't have anywhere to go either. Didn't need pointed ends. A basket. Pitch. That's the Babylonian report. Yeah? More facts. Our next question. How big was it? Well, it tells us in the scripture. Genesis 6.15 says, this is how you build it. The ark is to be 450 feet long, 70 feet wide, and 45 feet high. Okay. Little test. Somebody, no, nobody will be passing among you to mark. On your piece of paper, should you wish to, uh, take a look at the church from the back windows to the front, uh, from the whole side, so through the doors there into the office, all the way to the other side of the creche, and the height, and write down how many times bigger the width, length, and height of the arc would be. Okay? So how many times longer do you think the ark would be bigger than the church? Measurements are there. How many times wider do you think than the church, going from the far wall, to the far wall this side, than the church? And, and how much higher would you think it was going to be? Just talk to yourselves, we finished. Give you a little while. The deliverance of humanity. That's... What you and I 
have come to trust in. The deliverance of humanity was to be by means of an ark 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet high. A displacement, for those that are interested, where is John? He'll be very interested. Displacement of 43,300 tonnes. Does that interest you, John? No. Okay. Fair enough. Okay, you've got something written down? If you're playing my game, you've got something written down? Here we go then. This is how much bigger it would be. It would be four and a half times longer than the church. Four and a half times longer. Do you get that? Four and a half times longer? Good stuff. It would be one and a quarter times as wide as the church. One and a quarter times as wide as the church. And twice as high. Okay? Now, some of you are thinking, well, that's not very big. And some of you are thinking, wow, that's a bit big. So if you go out into the car park, go out to the car park, as you go home and get into your car, you have to think about it being about half the width of the car park at its widest and stretching from the entrance in Durley Avenue here all the way through to King's Road. That's approximately how big it was. How many other animals were gathered in was the next question that sprung to my mind. In Genesis 6, 19 to 21, it says this. You are to bring into the ark two of every living creatures, male and female, to keep them alive with you. Two of every kind of bird, of every kind of animal, of every kind of creature that moves uh, along the earth uh, will be kept alive with you. You are to take every kind of food that is to be eaten and store it away as food for you and for them. Now, when we get to next week, we might have a bit of conflict here because the two-by-two two thing is exactly what you get if you go to a toy shop and buy a toy ark. You get two zebras and you get two giraffes and you, get, you don't usually get elephants because they're too big. No. You get twos. But in chapter 7 verses 1 and 2, it actually says this. The Lord then said to Noah, go into the ark, you and your whole family, because I have found your, you righteous in this generation. Take with you seven of every kind of clean animal, a male and its mate, and two of every kind of unclean animal, a male and its mate. Right, anyway, we, it might become clear in just a moment. So some would claim that this uh, shield clearly shows how, uh, how poor the Bible is. It contradicts itself. It doesn't uh, give you any facts. You can't base your life on the Bible because even the Bible can't agree with itself. But you see, there's a di clear distinction between the two. There's a difference that becomes very important as life goes on, between clean and unclean animals. It's a clear distinction, as we find all the way through Leviticus, for example. So, for example, Leviticus 11, 1 to 23, uh, has this part in it. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, say to the Israelites of all the animals that live on the land, these are the ones you may eat. Now, I don't know whether you've ever thought... What did Noah and his wife and their sons and their sons' wives eat while they were bobbing around in my ark without sharp ends? Well, they ate the clean animals. What would they have used as sacrifice to God to thank him for their salvation? Well, they would have, ate, they would have used the clean animals. Well, that's a pretty poor way to preserve the fish and the birds and the life on the land if you only took two with you in the first place. So they needed more. So seven of every clean, two of every unclean. You need a male and female for reproduction. 
and presumably to kick-start life on Earth, you have to have some sort of attraction going on between them to start with. So a male and female might be a good way to start. Into the ark, all kinds of animals left to preserve the life of the Earth. There's a distinction made between the clean and the unclean. To, provide, to preserve the life of Noah, he has to take on some for food uh, and some for sacrifice. So seven of each of the kind of clean animal. So in answer to the question, remember the question this time was, how many animals gathered in? The answer is, I've got absolutely no idea. I'm not alone. Nobody else knows either. So how long did Noah spend building his ark? How long did it take? Okay, so uh, a brighter man than me, or several brighter men than me, that's not difficult, uh, have built you a little chart, which I've printed out for you. They've used accounts in uh, Genesis 5, 6, 7, 9, 10, and 11, and some reasonable explanations, and they say that it would have taken him between 55 and 75 years from the time that he started to the time that he completed the ark and was ready to go. Uh, you can see. Countdown to the flood begins about 120 years. Uh, he has his first son some 20 years later, perhaps, and so on. And if you read it through you get to somewhere between 55 and 75 years. After the ark's completed, he needs a few days, weeks, months, years, to gather the food aboard, load the ark, and there away we go. So, what does all that tell us? What information does it have? If we want something more than that lovely story that we all heard, that we all heard at Sunday school, should we have been sent? Should we have been taken? Should we have been encouraged to go? That lovely story of Mr. Noah and Mrs. Noah and three sons of Noah and their three wives in the ark with two of every, every kind of animal in a nice ark bobbing along. What else is there in this story for us? Why have we stopped here? Why have we bothered even thinking about the ark? Because it's so straightforward. That's it. That's the end. That's the account. It's a factual account of what happened. But what aren't we told? What are we left to puzzle over? What, what's left here for us? In verse 22 it says, about Noah's great faith, Noah did everything just as God commanded. Verse 13 it says, sorry, back one. And God said to Noah, now, I wonder whether you've ever thought about that phrase. And God said to Noah. Uh, do you think it was an audible voice? Do you think it was um, just, just a, a, a feeling he had? Do you, do you think it was a quiet whispering in his ears? How do you think God spoke to Noah? and pass these instructions on to him. You see, these instructions were quite precise. The type of wood, the exact size, what he then had to do, why he had to do it. How do you think God spoke to Noah? Well, he wasn't sitting in church one Sunday morning and Phil got up and preached a sermon and people felt convicted and that's how it happened. But however God spoke to Noah, it was amazing. Because God spoke to Noah about building a boat, a floaty thing out of wood. 
people Noah had never experienced the sea, perhaps had never even seen rain. He wasn't a sailor. He wouldn't have known about making it so that it floated nicely. He was totally reliant on whatever it was God said to him and continued to say to him through these many, many, many years for the exact way in which he built this ark. It wasn't a sort of feeling that came over him and he thought about, well, let's just sort of start collecting a menagerie. He didn't go up to Mrs. Noah one day and say, I think we ought to keep a few chickens. Or I feel really led that we ought to keep some cows. He went up to Mrs. Noah one day and said, God has told me that I've got to go out and get some wood. Not just a few sticks for a fire, but I've got to go out into the forest and start cutting down huge numbers of trees. He didn't wake up one day and say to Mrs. Noah, Mrs. Noah, I I'm going to change the job that I do. I've decided to become an accountant, or a farmer, or a philosopher. He woke up one day and said to Mrs. Noah, Mrs. Noah, I'm embarking upon a change of life, like something you've never seen before in your life. He didn't say to Mrs. Noah, Mrs. Noah, things around us are getting quite bad. I think we need to try and cut ourselves off from the neighbourhood. I think we ought to move out of town, away from the bad people, so our family can grow up where it's nice. Mr. Noah woke up one morning and said, Darling, God's told me a plan that's going to make us the butt of all the jokes in the neighbourhood. God's told me a plan where we're going to be the most despised people <coughs> that you've ever known. He woke up one morning and said to Mrs. Noah, God's got me to do something that's going to mean we're going to be ridiculed for the rest of our lives, or at least the next 50 to 70 years of our lives. And every morning he woke up and set about doing what God told him to do. Despite the abuse and the ridicule, the laughing, despite everybody around him telling him what an idiot he was, every day he got up and set about faithfully being obedient to God's instructions. It wasn't a short-lived thing. I don't know whether God told him day one that it was going to take him as long as it did. I don't know whether God revealed to him right at the beginning exactly step by step how it was going to be. I, I, I don't know how all those animals came to be in the same place at the same time ready to be loaded. Noah had such a faith that when God spoke to him what would have must have seemed an absolutely ridiculous thing got up day after day after day after day after day after day after day and just got on and did it. Hebrews 11 says by faith Noah when warned about things not yet seen, in holy fear, 
built an ark to save his family. By his faith, he condemned the world and became the heir of righteousness that comes by faith. He condemned the world, not because of his attitude, not because of the way that he spoke to them. He didn't, you know, tell them they were all bound for somewhere else. It, it doesn't tell us that he needed to try and evangelize them and try and get them to change their ways in order to join him on his ark. The brief description that we have and our understanding of how the world was at that time was that that would have been futile anyway. But these people that he was living amongst, that God thought were so horrendous that he had no other way of dealing with things but to wipe them out. Uh, can you imagine them giving Noah and his wife and his sons and their wives uh, an easy time? They weren't just dismissive. They weren't just cold-shouldering him. They would have been actively aggressive perhaps physically preventing him sometimes, doing the work that God had given him to do, and yet, day after day, up he got to build an ark, having never seen a boat in his life, having no concept of enough water to be present where he was living to get this thing ever off the ground. It wasn't until he and his animals, he and all God wanted to save, were inside the ark that there was any physical evidence at all that God was going to answer his prayers, that God was going to fulfill his word. You see, Noah is the very essence of that great at that great uh, verse at the beginning of Hebrews 11. Now faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. So much of what Noah was being asked to do, he didn't have no concept about at all. <coughs> certain of what he did not see. So much of what he was being asked to do was something that he must have hoped for every day of all those years before God spoke to him. As he faithfully lived a life for God among those people, those horrendous people we've had described to us, as he faithfully lived a life dedicated to God in that time before God spoke to him, he lived a life of being sure of what he hoped for. A life in God's presence. A life enjoying the peace of God. A life enjoying the certainty and shelter of God. And when we think about the faith that Noah exhibited in building in being obedient in believing that blows my mind you know I have struggles when I hear a, a Bible passage that I know is very relevant for me and the spirit moves within me I say that's what God's telling me to do I have struggles then. I have a desire to see signposts as I follow what I believe is God's path for my life. I, I, I want to see signposts to say I'm doing the right thing. Things are going the right way. Perhaps people come in and encouraging me. Or, or random people saying to me things that fit in with what I believe is uh, what God's asking me to do. all this time that Noah was being obedient to God, there was nobody giving him that encouragement. 
his spiritual ears must have been so attuned to what God was saying to him that he managed to filter out all of the rubbish around him. He must have had such faith in God that despite what his eyes could see and his ears could hear in the natural world, he was so tuned in to what God wanted that he made himself look foolish, laughable, a laughing stock among the people he was living with. I'm so glad God didn't choose me for the task. It might have been a different outcome. It doesn't matter whether it was 55 years or 75 years or 100 years. It could be measured in those sort of minutes, and I might have struggled. You see, Noah was saved. He and his wife, his children, his three sons and their wives were saved through him faithfully following God's instructions that were beyond his understanding. Beyond his understanding. We are saved through our faith in a sacrifice that he's provided for us. He, our Heavenly Father, has provided for us through the work of his Son, our Saviour. And we're going to have to celebrate that in a few moments. In Hebrews, people are commended for their faith. Noah among them. And when I measure my faith against Noah's faith or against the others that are mentioned there, and yet I realize that I stand this side of the cross, that I'm reasonably educated and understand, have a reasonable intellect to try and figure out some of these things, that I can come and fellowship with other people, that there are people, scholars, that will tell me what the Bible says and what God has for me. And yet Noah and many of these others had lives that are so much more complex and difficult, circumstances that were harder to be faithful in. I wonder why I make so many excuses. I wonder why I try and find the easy way out. I wonder why I'm so often reluctant to make that step of faith, even when prompted, even when given the opportunity. The account of Noah is given for lots of different reasons. It helps us to understand a man of faith, something we're called to be. It helps us to understand just how serious God takes disobedience, wickedness, and sin. It was anathema to him, and he wanted to wipe it out. But it helps us, too, to understand how fortunate we are to be able to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ for our salvation. And not be put in a position where we have to build or do or work at something that took so long and much such ridicule and such difficult circumstances. Let's bow our heads and pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the precious privilege we have 
of having that perfect example in understanding that the Lord Jesus Christ liveth amongst us to show us how to live. Heavenly Father, we thank and praise you for the preciousness of being able to understand that because of our sinfulness that you gave the Lord Jesus Christ to die on the cross to take away the punishment for our sin. We're sorry, Father, when you ask us to move by faith and we want to move by signs. We want to move by questioning exactly what it is that we're expected to do in finite detail. We're sorry for the times that we have such a lack of faith. We thank you for your patience with us. We thank you that your love for us and your care for us and your understanding of you is just immense. Help us to be more faithful, we pray. Help us to look at that great example of Noah and realize that the steps you ask us to take are much smaller, much less dangerous, much less uncertain. And we pray that by the Holy Spirit's power within us and strength, we will live faithful lives for you. Thank you for the message that you bring us through the life of Noah. In Jesus' name.